uh, either diversion programs or uh, services inside are not confidential, right? Like, right. people don't get the opportunity to have a confidential conversation with their therapist like they do with their, you know, paying to go see someone on the Upper West Side in New York, right? Right. That people don't realize that when you get mental, what are called mental health services prison, you don't get confidentiality. And the quality is, you know, it's about controlling you. It's about... Um, policing you, it's about punishing you, it's right. about saying, you know, maybe if you just acted like a lady, you know, maybe if you respected yourself, it's all kinds of, you know, um, uh, ways of policing people's behavior. And so I completely agree with you that, you know, what people get on the inside is not mental health services, it's right. <laughs> it's torture. And then also they, people use, and Angela Davis talks about this in her work, um, they use medication also to control people inside, right? Oh, yeah. So, um, she was saying when she first got locked up, people were like, oh, here's your medication. She was like, I, I don't need psychiatric medication, but I see how you're using it here to control the women inside and also, um, yeah, to just kind of make them pacify generally and then also to make them believe there's something wrong with them when in fact there's nothing wrong with them, right? Right. And so, um, the, so, and also someone just recently, I saw a video of someone talking about like, being in prison and how, for her, the last sort of few decades of her life were like being restrained by handcuffs or how And that really struck me because it was like, you know, medication could be just like handcuffs. It's yeah. used to police and punish, right? And yeah. it's, it's literally it's in your body. It's not even an external thing on your body. And so I feel like that, when we're thinking about what alternatives to mental health are or making sure that people you know, inside get mental health treatment, we like to think about what do we mean by that? Right. The question you raised is so important because um, it doesn't sound like the kind of mental health treatment other people might think of when they hear that word. They're like, oh, great, people are getting counseling. That's so fantastic. It's like right. when I go to my therapist. It's <laughs> not. <laughs> so, it's infuriating. So, so you say you watched a video. Was that on a social media outlet? Uh, I'll send it to you. It was okay. Really, it was good. Yeah, because I'm wondering, um, like, social media is helping to draw attention to issues and stories related to criminalization, racism, sexism, et cetera, right? And I want to know for you, other than maybe maybe this video, was there, like, a particular situation where you saw social media really help or really hurt the movement? Um, I think social media has really helped and I'll say why. I mean, particularly because... Uh, of this thing around invisibility that we were talking about right at the beginning, yeah. which is that, you know, it's not like women haven't been telling their stories for a long time, right? Like a lot of the stories that talk about the book, mm-hmm. people testified at public hearings. I went through pages and pages of testimony in front of Amnesty International or the NAACP or the U.S. Civil and Human Rights Com- or the U.S. Civil Rights Commission or people testified in front of treaty bodies, U.N. treaty bodies. I'm told women have been coming forward telling their stories, city council hearings. Mm-hmm. But people kind of like when Holtzclaw was raping black women, just didn't kind of respond. The story just never kind of floated to the surface and didn't become central to the conversations those organizations or our broader society were having about policing. Yeah. And what I think happens with social media is we just like bypass the, the gatekeepers and the, the people who decide which stories are worth telling and which stories are worth advocating around, mm-hmm. and we just tell them, right? Right. And we tell them on social media, and and then they get lifted up. That said, I still think that doesn't solve the problem, right? Like, right. in the last two, two weeks, Stephon Clark's been killed, and Cynthia Clemens has been killed, and there's a lot more conversation about Stephon Clark and a lot less about Cynthia Clemens, and I think a few reasons for that. One is there's, like, a really organized movement in Sacramento where Stephon Clark was killed, um, there's an organized movement here in Chicago, but um, the city was killed like in a northern suburb, so it's like a little bit of a, a different kind of situation, right? Right. Um, but I think even when social media is sort of, you know, uh, discerning which stories are going to start trending, a similar kind of screening process happens. Um, hmm. So and I think just generally, not specific to black women and brown um, women, is that I think the availability, like you can watch all kinds of police violence on social media. You can watch people die um, from being shot or tased by police on social media a lot. Yeah. And so I think it does kind of then become, I don't want to say routine, but it becomes, we become a little bit inured to it, you know, mm-hmm. and, and from its availability. So I think 
I think we need to really, as we're watching that stuff, like just really kind of be like, this is not a video game. It's like humanity. This is, this is not normalizing black death. This is um, highlighting the the real consequences and lived reality of anti-blackness in this country. Like I think there's a danger that it can just um, numb us to black death and, and violence against black bodies in a way that um, I hope we can avoid. Yeah, for sure. And and you know what I think about I think about we in in mainstream media, right? We we often hear the stories like we hear about crime and criminals from police perspective, right? And so that's often what what gets into the mainstream media, which leads to public misconceptions. And these incomplete pictures of the lives of black women and women of color is often missing important facts and truth. So how mm-hmm. does that so 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 how does that narrative then affect how women of color and trans people are treated in courts, prisons, and in society once they return to the community? I mean, that's definitely it, it can contribute to um, furthering narratives around like criminalizing narratives or um, narratives of black women as inherently engaged in deviant behavior, inherently criminal, inherently violent. Right. So mm-hmm. I think. Um, I think it's important to try, and I, I try and do this in the book and for other folks who are trying to tell these stories, to, like, look past the 10, minutes, 10 seconds of the dash cam video, right? Or look past the, the um, you know, two minutes of cell phone footage um, to try and find out who this person was, right. how they might have been feeling in that moment, what, what the fullness of their life was, right? I think, um, uh, you know, that recently there's this, um, Oscar-nominated documentary traffic stop that showed like the dash cam footage and this like moment of horrific violence by a police officer against a young black woman in Austin, Texas. But then goes on to talk about who she is, what her life is, what her life is when she's not being thrown around by the police. You know, like what might have been going through her mind when that was happening, right? What she knows about black people in her community dying when they have police encounters and suddenly realizing like, oh, this might be the day it happens to me, you know, and, and that that was driving her reactions in that moment. So I think it's really important to make sure that we're, we're representing three-dimensional people. And I think the same is true when we're talking about women after their death. But I think sometimes we just say a name, right? But we don't say what we knew about that person and the fullness of them, right? So to Cynthia Clemens is a mom. Right. Um, she, has, she has a teenage son. She you know, is described by, you know, friends and family as someone who was always a life of the party, you know, right. brought a lot of joy into the world and into the space. Like, that's what we need to remember instead of, like, watching a, a, only what we see on, like, a 10-minute video clip. And I feel like that's critical. And it's something that, you know, I've really worked hard to do and not always been as successful as I could have been. But I think that it, we need to make sure that we're not feeding dehumanizing narratives in our efforts to lift up dehumanizing treatment of black women. Absolutely. And um, I thank you so much for, for um, a lot in this time being flexible with your schedule. Um, I only have like a couple more questions for you. I'm, I'm totally down um, with that. And uh, and yeah, I just also know I'm giving you long winded answers. So thanks. For nah, that. it's good because you answered all the questions that I, I had to <laughs> take out. So <laughs> that's good. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. So for me, I write lyrics as a way to process my experience. Mm. And I want to know if you see a role for arts and culture in bringing attention to these issues of violence and criminalization against women of color. And do you see it as a role for helping women of color recover and process their experience within this criminal justice system? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, there was a beautiful book of poetry that came out around the same time as my book called Testify by a poet named uh, Simone John. Mm-hmm. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, heartbreaking book of poetry um, that kind of remixes the audio tape of Sandra Bland's Traffic Stop into yeah. poetry. Yeah. And then also um, remixes the testimony of the young woman who was talking to Trayvon Martin when he was killed. Oh, wow. Um, on the phone into testimony, uh, into, into poetry. And then also has, you know, sort of lots of poems about um, the poet healing from her own experiences of policing and that of people in her community. And, um, you know, I think uh, Aja Monet uh, had a poem called Say Her Name. There yes. was a group of poets in L.A. who 
after Sandra Bland was killed, just kept coming together every month to do some kind of poetry and art to process that right. story, but also other stories like it in their communities and just generally the issue. And so, you know, there was kind of a Say Her Name poetry series that went on for like two years um, after she was killed to just kind of create space for people to come forward and, and talk about it, process it, and heal from it. And so I think those those are the spaces where I see, you know, just telling stories, using art to lift them up and to lift up fierce resistance right? Um, and successful resistance um, are really um, hopeful spaces, I think. Yes. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Last can't qu- wait to read your poetry. What? <laughs> I know. I, I should. I should post something. It's, it's hidden in some <laughs> notebooks at home. But no, I, I really, I really was thinking about that, especially um, while reading your book, because mm-hmm. the invisibility of all these women's stories, like a lot of them, were um, stories I've never heard of. You know, mm-hmm. so and I'm sure a lot of people have never heard of, and and I think that is a huge problem when we just classify, um, you know, police brutality as if it only happened to men when of course it happens to women too at this you know at the same rate mm-hmm. so um i know you've been working for like 20 plus years um on these issues and 15 years on this book and you know it sounds like when you talk about it you be you be hyped up it be getting you hype right yeah but but yes. but i think i think probably is like is is also equally emotional and and the struggle mm-hmm. the struggle of it can just seem sometimes you might probably fade into like slits um like slits of of hopelessness. And I don't want to like really say it in that way, but sometimes if you've been working on these issues for decades and decades and decades, and and we're still in the same struggles when we have all this evidence, all this information is like, what are you doing to ensure self care? That's a real question, um, and it's one that I had to learn when I was finishing the book because I think for a lot of years I was so angry at how much um, black women's stories and women of color stories were being shut out and left out and kind of glossed over in the mainstream conversation that my anger carried me through, you know, and yeah. I, I would tell the stories kind of from an angry place, right? Like, come on now. Right. <laughs> look at this. Like, look at this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I reached a bit of a breaking point when I worked on the book because it was like basically I've been doing it kind of that off and on in between other kinds of organizing and, and work and legal work and so on. And then when I just started working on the book for like the last kind of nine months before mm-hmm. it came out, I, I would, my partner would come home and find me like sobbing on the floor and be like, okay, how many videos did you watch today? You need yeah. to like limit this to like two videos <laughs> a day, no more. Um, and then I also moved near water um, for that last nine months. And I so much time I would just spend literally just standing in the water, like yeah. just letting Lake Michigan kind of hold those stories and hold that space that I didn't have to carry them all so much. Right. Um, and just learned. Um, but I also learned the power of the conversations that we're having, right? Like I think probably this morning there was some part of me that woke up and was like, oh, I'm excited to talk to Janelle, but I don't want to talk about the book. You know, I don't want oh, to man. Talk about the Bible. <laughs> I don't want to talk about police violence. Like, I just have one day where I don't talk about police violence. Right? <laughs> I, have more, I have more and more of those days. I'm like, oof. Like I'm excited when there's a day where I don't have to talk about the book. And the conversations about the book give me life, right? Like I feel so much better having talked to you for an hour about the book than I did before because I feel like we are making space for each other's stories. Yeah. We're, we're, we're making sure that we're um, putting it out into the world that, that Ford creates. We're reaching the people that Ford can reach. Yeah. And we're doing that from a place of like mutual care and, and empowerment. And I feel like that is what gives me juice probably more than anything <laughs> else, right? Well, good. Like literally connecting with people and being like, how are we going to fight this together? Yeah. How, how does this promote our own healing? How does this how can we promote other people's healing? And how can we make changes so that no one has to experience the kind of violence we're talking about? So right. those, those are the ways, I think. Um, and music. You know, I went to see some live music last night, and I was like, this is what I need to keep feeding my soul, you know? It doesn't <laughs> yeah. really kind of really matter what kind of live music. It's right. just got to be something. So those are some things I do. All right. Well, that's great. 
Thank you yeah. so much for a great conversation. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'm so grateful to you. That was just, like I said, that's really made my day. Um, so, wait, I kind of do have, you. I kind of do have one small question. Great. Tell me. Are you going to write a part two? I don't know. I'm trying to think <laughs> about it. You know, I was like, I'm going away actually on this writing retreat in the fall to mm-hmm. see if I have another book in me. Okay. And if I do, like, what, what is that book? So some ideas of how I've been like talking to people I know in movements who have had their own experiences of police violence that they never talk about, right? Yeah, so there's right. people leading movements right now around policing mm-hmm. who are women or queer and trans people who have their own experiences that they don't talk about. And what, what would it mean for them to be able to open up about that and how it shaped their work? Another one is sort of like going back to find some of the women whose stories are told in the book and figure out where, like, how their lives have been shaped and how, how they've healed also, right? Yeah. So one example is like there's a girl, that, well, she's a woman now, but I talk about a, a girl who was arrested when she was five years old in kindergarten. Yeah. And I read recently a story about her that she's like in college and she's like, bite me. <laughs> I'm living my best oh, life. Oh, man. You know? like, exactly. You know, so I think, I think there is a way in which we tend to focus on like, and then if something like that happens, then your life is ruined forever. And I think there's very much possibility for that, which is why we don't want it to happen. But we also want to show people, like, survive and are resilient. Right. These issues, right. Absolutely, yeah. So those are some ideas. And also some people are like, you need to do more about, you know, how capitalism drives this kind of policing and at the intersection of race and gender and sexuality. I was like, oh, Lord, that sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> so oh, I wonder man. if I should just write, you know, bad poetry or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, if you, if you ever um want to run something across me for for some more ideas, um, I'd be willing. Absolutely. Do you have, Anytime. Do you have ideas? Are you gonna write a book? When are you gonna write a book? Oh man, I think I'm just gonna write music. <laughs> All right. I could. I, I could. I that. could start there. I could start there. I can't wait to hear that. All right, Andrea. Can't thank wait. you again so much for your time. Thank you so much. I can't wait to um, read it or see it or hear it. And um, and I'm really just excited to see what you're going to be doing in the next three months or beyond. So stay in touch. I will definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> That's it? It's off? Yep. It's off. Oh, that was so cool. <laughs> She's funny, um, too. You were me.